So here's a problem I was working on in class just recently. We have two masses on a slope and they're connected to each other through this rope and pulley system. And I think I asked, what if we release this thing from rest? What's the acceleration of block number one and block number two or some question like that? And as we were working through the problem, some students really questioned this. They made an argument that this problem is really ill-posed. The rope wouldn't remain tight. It would go slack. It wouldn't hold the pulleys together. And they proposed instead that the problem should look like this. Ramp should slope the other way. In this case, we'd have a tension in the rope which would hold those pulleys in the configuration so that this we would have some meaningful dynamics that we can consider. So what I want to do in this question right now is to, to ask which one of these two problems is well posed. One or the other, or both, I guess. And once we find the well posed problem, can we find the tension in the cable? Now for SMART and how we set up the problem, we don't have to solve these two problems separately. We can do both of them in one shot, right? Because they're really the same system. The only difference is we have a slope one way in one problem and the other way in the other problem. But if I parameterize this slope by this angle theta, then I can think of this, this problem or this family of problems being problems where we have a positive angle theta. And all I have to do is let that theta go negative and I would get this other one. So if I write out my problem very generally in terms of the angle theta, I just have to analyze it once. So here we go to the problem solving board. We've got this, the system sketched up here. And let me just list out my givens. I'm given the masses, the two masses, M1 and M2. I'm given the slope of the ramp. And I'll just throw in G here too. But G is always given to us, so I don't have to list it. I want to find at least the, the concrete thing I want to find is this cable tension, assuming a cable tension exists in this case. And I'm going to use or I'm going to apply my usual pulley assumptions. So let's start drawing some free body diagrams. Here's block number one. Uh, it obviously has a weight pulling down on it, has a normal force acting on block one. I'm using basis vectors e hat n and e hat t. So my normal force is in the e hat n direction. And then it has a tension of this cable pulling down on it. And that it acts in the e hat t direction. So I get t e hat t there. Now for block number two, I'm going to consider block number two everything inside this green rectangle here. So that includes these two pulleys there. That'll come up in just a second. So I got weight of block number two pulling down. I've got normal force on block number two uh, pushing in the E hat N direction, just like I had before. And now what about this tension? Notice with my rectangular block here, so everything inside the rectangular block or rectangular box is my is my a body, so notice that this one has four tensions attached to it. One, two, three, four. So, and it's the same same rope as, as this one attached to M1. So I have four tensions pulling in the minus E hat uh, T direction. And there's my free body diagrams. Now when I drive, draw my mass acceleration diagrams, um, it's pretty straightforward. I do the same thing I usually do. I draw these accelerations in the uh, positive direction. Notice all my acceleration, I have no acceleration in E hat N direction because everything's moving along the line. So I'm going to just draw these things in the positive um, M, let's see, M1, A1 in the E hat T direction and do this one M2, A2, E hat T. Again, acceleration is unknown. If it turns out to be the negative direction then it'll wash out in the mathematics. So where does that leave me? It looks Since all my accelerations in the E hat T direction or minus E hat T direction if that turns out to be the case, um, all my dynamics are in this E hat T direction. Since I have no friction I don't really care what these normal forces are. So I'm going to need to decompose that weight into a normal and tangential components. So let me squeeze that in here. So the weight on block number one is going to be um, how much in the e hat t. So I've got a little four vector triangle that way and that way. So I'm thinking and this angle right there would be theta. So I'm thinking this is um, m1 g sine theta in the e hat t plus actually minus m1 g cosine theta in the e hat n. And wow. I didn't get a chance to squeeze in the W2 there, but it's pretty much the same thing, right? I got a component in the E hat T, another component in the E hat N, 
and it's going to be the same sine and cosine. Both these things are at the same angle. So really, maybe I could just say Wj equals Mjg cosine or sine theta, Mjg cosine theta, e hat n. Now I think I'm ready to start deriving some equations of motion. So we're using Newton's second law. So I'll just say Newton here. And for block number one, in the e hat t direction, this is what I get. I could just list off my my forces. So I've got a component of the weight, m1g uh, sine theta, it looks like, uh, plus the tension in the cable is equal to m1a1. And for block number two in the e hat t direction, I have, again, uh, the, the tangential component of the weight. And now when I put the tension in there, it has to be, well, first of all, it has to be in the other direction because the rope can only pull, it can't push. So it's in the minus e hat t direction. And I'm going to get four of them, right? Remember, I have four little ropes sitting here. So I got four of these, these tensions. And that has to equal m2a2. So whenever I have equations derived, I like to do a little bit of accounting. So this will be equation number one. This will be equation number two. And so that's all I get from Newton's second law. How many unknowns do I have? Notice that one of my unknowns is tension. I have another one in A1 and another one in A2. It's starting to look familiar to me. We've got three unknowns for our two equations. And we need another expression in order to work this thing out. We need another relationship between these variables. Um, in the past, we found that there's a relationship between the A1 and the A2 due to the constraint that this rope has to remain a constant length. So let's try that real quick. I'll sort of clear off some space so we can write and think. So you'll recall that I have a, a recipe for finding the kinematic relationships between uh, two blocks in a pulley system. And the way that that recipe goes is we try to come up with a mathematical expression for the length of this rope. It's not so bad, but we have to define some quantities first. So when I ask students, ask students who kind of know what's going on, uh, what to do here, what I usually get is something like this. I get one leg, leg of segment defined to be this one right there. Let's call this S1. And I have another uh, segment, actually more than one segment. I'm going to call this distance right here S2. And if I do this, the length of the rope turns out to be what? Well, I've got this distance S1, so L is equal to S1, and I got a little bit of constant in that uh, half a circumference, so I get a constant there. I'll leave off the constant right now. I get another little constant over here, and another constant there, and another constant right here, so a whole bunch of constants. But I have the S1, there's that one, and I have 1, 2, 3 S3, so plus 3s3s plus, I'm just going to call it c. It's, it's the sum of all these constants going halfway around each pulley in this little gap right there. So there's my expression for the length of my rope. And before using this, I want to make an observation. That, so let's suppose I did things just a little bit differently. Let me uh, carry this line up just a little bit more. And what if I call, instead of using s1 to denote this entire gap, what if I call this distance right there um, I'll call that S1B. It's a different S1, right? And if I write my length of my screen, excuse me, string this way, what do I get? I got S1B, and then now I have one, two, three, four lengths of S3 plus some more constants. In fact, the exact same constants I had before, so I can just keep the same symbol for that. All right, so I have two different ways of writing this length. Which one's better? Oh, it's kind of hard to tell. They're both valid lengths of the of the ropes, but one is going to help out more than the other, at least more easily than the other. And let me get to that through talking about the velocity. So now I can write the velocity of each block quite straightforwardly. So velocity of block number one would be, I'm going to just call it V1 in the E hat T direction. And velocity of block number two, again, we'll call it V2 in the E hat two direction. Now, what, can I, what sense can I make of this? Can I make the connection back to, uh, back to these S's? So let's start with V2 here. So V2 
equals, and notice what I've got here. This S2, it's anchored, or this left side of S2 is anchored to the, to the center of that pulley, which doesn't move. The right side of S2 is hooked, or is anchored on that block, which does move. So if this S2 is increasing at a rate of three feet per second, then my mass M2 here has to be moving to the right at three meet, excuse me, three feet per second. That's what I said, right? So the speed of, of block two is S2 dot. The question is the sign. So if S2 is increasing at a rate of three feet per second, in other words, S2 dot is positive, right? S2 increasing. Then the velocity of block number two is going to be to the, to the right, which is where to go, here's the positive e hat t direction. So I don't need a minus sign this time, it's kind of nice. So I got v2 equals s2 dot in the e hat 2 direction. Let's go back to v1. What am I going to do with that thing? Well, if I go with my original coordinates here, where I, ju where I just have an s1 instead of this s1b, um, what's s1? Well, s1 is the gap between the two blocks. So if blo both blocks are moving, this gap here, right here is not the velocity of any one block. It's some combination of both these blocks. So it's going to be a little difficult to use S1. So that's why I suggest perhaps we try a different labeling of the lengths. What if I use S1B instead? In that case, I'll have four of the S3s, but I'm cool with that. S3, what is that? By the way, over here, I made a mistake. I didn't catch myself. This is, these are S2s, not S3s. All right, so let's jump back into the problem again. I want to write the velocity of, of block number one. This time I'm using S1B. S1B is a really good choice because the right-hand side, or one side of this thing, is, is connected to something that does not move, right? This pulley right here does not move to the left or to the right. So S1B represents a distance. S1B dot's going to represent the rate at which the position of block number one is changing. So think about it. Let's say S1B dot is a positive one foot per second. That would mean mass one is moving at a positive one foot per second in the negative e hat t direction. Right? So S1B dot, B dot, is related to the velocity. It's a one-to-one -one relationship, but I need a minus sign there to make it work for me. All right, so now that we've decided we're going to use this version of the length right here, let's go ahead and take that time derivative. I get L dot equals S1B dot plus 4S2 dot plus C dot, and of course those constants, uh, when we take the derivative of them, they're zero. So this leads us to S1 b dot plus 4s2 dot equal to zero. Now if I substitute in my expressions or my relationships between the s's and the v's, something kind of nice happens. I find that s1b is minus v1 and s2 dot, s1b dot is minus v1 and s2 dot was v2. So minus v1 plus 4v2 has to add up to zero. Let me just take a time derivative of this thing because what I want is the acceleration. So I got minus v1 dot plus 4 v2 dot is equal to zero. And of course, these v dots and v2, v1 dot, v2 dot, those are components of the acceleration, right? Uh, acceleration of one uh, by definition, well, I'll call it a1 in the e hat t, which by definition is v1 dot in the e hat 2 and similarly with with a2 I can do pretty much write the same thing. This relationship between a1 and v1 dot, which is nothing earth shattering here, it's really just the definition, tells us that uh, what? v1 dot is just a1 so I got minus a1 plus 4 a2 equals 0 or a1 equals 4 a2. What does that mean? That means block number 1 accelerates four times as much as block number two does. That's kind of cool. Another thing important is the sign here. Notice both of these have the same sign. So if block two is accelerating down the hill, block one must also be accelerating down the hill. And we're going to end it right there, at least for, for part number one. And we'll pick up uh, right where we're leaving off right here in part number two, and you can watch the dramatic conclusion to the problem.